Hello and welcome to a, uh, another video in the Key Concepts lecture series uh, that we are currently doing on YouTube and on my WordPress account. Today we are looking at part two of the Key Concepts of Hegel. If you missed part one, we were talking about Hegel and the philosophical foundations that he was building off of. And today uh, I'm joined by Sean. How are you doing, Sean? Good, thanks, Reese. Uh, and we're going to be looking at Hegel's actual key concepts in this video. If you go into the description, you'll be able to find uh, links to the WordPress account that I'm currently running. And Sean also writes a lot for Counterfire, uh, which is kind of like a, a news. Or well, how would you describe Counterfire, Sean? Uh, a left wing website. A left wing website. And Sean posts a lot of book reviews and think pieces there as well. So I strongly recommend that you check those out and they deliver content daily. Um, now, like I said, this is part two. So Sean's going to be taking us through the key concepts of uh, Hegel, which we are going to be looking at here. So we have these which uh, Sean has picked out. We've got the master slave parable. We've got Hegel's philosophy of history. We've got the cunning of reason, which we mentioned in the last video. And we have got the concept of Hegelian dialectics, which we briefly looked at in these videos before, but it was in the context of Marx. And Sean's going to be providing us a lot more detail on the uh, Hegelian take. Or it is, uh, How much difference is there between Hegel and Marx, just out of interest? A lot and a little. How about yeah. that a dialectical answer? Yeah, I was struggling to think mm, how much of. Yeah, I can think of the differences, but in terms of the overall. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then we're going to have a do some concluding remarks just on Hegel's legacy and whether there is a theory uh, of everything that Hegel has come up with, which we kind of hinted at at the end of the last video. As I said before we get into this, I would strongly recommend that if you aren't familiar with Hegel, you watch the first video first and then we'll come back and we'll take a look at these concepts. So let's start with the first one. Let's start with the. Oh, no, we need to talk about his key work. So do you want to say a few words just on his key work, Sean? Yeah, so the uh, thing is that Hegel wrote um, a huge amount about a huge amount of topics. So this is not his entire corpus of work, uh, but these are the ones that personally I think are the key works. And I think there's also a bit of debate within the Galen sort of commentators about, OK, which of these which of these four is the most important? Uh, so at various times, some scholars have said, OK, phenomenology, phenomenology of mind is the key. Then at other times people have said, science of logic so these are the four ones that i think are are the are, are the keys uh, but then you say with, within hegelian sort of studies there's a bit about okay which, which one of these is the key text but i think the other thing that hopefully should become apparent is that there is a sort of there, there is a sort of there's a unity within he hegel's work so although he's looking at these different topics hopefully people will see there is a sort of similarity of method and a similarity of approach that, that does form a sort of a unity within Hegel's work. So um, he's looking at... The, sorry to interrupt. I think those are the perfect kind of where to start books for Hegel, to be honest. Like if you want him to get a kind of general general idea of his key ideas and key concepts, I think that those books are definitely where you begin. Yeah, and I think the, the way the way we've done this uh, this presentation is that we're going to start with hopefully relatively straightforward ideas, and then we're going to build up to the real sort of uh, uh, brain twisting ideas towards the end, uh, and that in some ways does reflect Hegel's own philosophical development. I mean, the early text Phenomenology of Mind that contains the Master Slave Parable, which we'll look at next, and that is relatively straightforward, and so in some ways that is a good place to start for people who are totally new to Hegel. Absolutely. Very good. Well, I think seeing as you've done a nice little intro into that, we might as well move on and start with the master slave parable. So do you want to tell us what the master slave parable is in, in Hegel's work? So th th I think this is a great place to start Hegel because it's fundamentally only about two individuals and their relationship to each other. So it's something that people can understand on any sort of level. So the master slave parable is essentially this idea that you've got you've got two hypothetical individuals Essentially, one is the boss and the other is the slave. On the first um, thinking about it, the boss is in complete charge. The boss tells the slave what to do. The slave works for the boss. But over the course of time, it becomes apparent that the boss is entirely dependent on the slave. The boss can't eat or, or drink or um, have any sort of shelter without, without the function of the slave. So, and eventually, over the course of time. Now, again, I think process is a key part of Hegelian thinking and thinking about how 
over the course of time, situations change. I think one of the great things about Hegel is a lot of a lot of pre-Hegelian philosophy has quite a static view of, of, of the world around us. Hegel is essentially a very dynamic thinker. So th this master-slave relationship initially looks like, OK, it's a very, the master is in charge. But when you look at it as a process over time, the slave actually starts to take some element of charge. The slave understands that the boss depends entirely on him. So over the course of time, cumulatively, um, the slave develops some self-respect because the slave understands that what, what he does actually keep, keeps the master in place. So the, 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 what, it starts off as a one-way relationship and then it builds into a relationship based on partly equilibrium. Now, I think the other thing to say about this is that in some ways this is typical Hegel because the, the focus is on the consciousness. I mean, I think you asked me at the beginning, Reese, is, is Hegel an, an idealist? And in a sense, he is because he's only the thing to understand is that the relationship between the master and slave doesn't change physically or economically or even politically, it only changes in a psychological sense. Now, you know, I think you asked it again a minute ago, what's the difference between Marx and Hegel? I was about to he ask that question now, actually. <laughs> So, so Hegel would say the fact that the slave develops a, a self-respect, that is really the end of the story. Whereas for Marx, the, the, the new self-respect of the slave is not the end of the story. This story only ends essentially when the slave expropriates the master. So that is one of the ways in which Marx would, would want to develop um, Hegel's ideas. Uh, and again, the, like a lot of Hegel's thinking has this triadic structure. So you can think about this as, as a, a, a three stage process. Part one, the master tells the slave what to do. Part two, the slave starts to develop a sense of his own self-respect. And then phase three, the, uh, the, the two have a sort of psychological equilibrium. And again, we'll see this triadic structure a lot in, um, in, uh, in Hegel's approaches to other things. Absolutely. So it's a key concept that we need to bear in mind as we go through the rest of Hegel's thought. Um, so how much uh, would you would you argue that the master slave parable is kind of the one of the essential foundations for Hegel that will then build off of? I, I think it's just a great way to get into Hegel. And I think what uh, it gives you a sense into, uh, I said, that the subtlety and the dynamism of his way of thinking. I think, you know, an Hegelian approach to problems is really a very sort of dynamic one situations are never static situations always evolve and the the master slave parable is a classic example of this uh, i think it's also worth noting that this the psychology of this is very important as well because hegel is saying that our own psychological well-being fundamentally depends on other people our view of ourself really comes from our interaction with others i think you know in in, the, in, in sociology and modern and psychology today there's this concept of what called the looking glass self our notion of ourselves is fundamentally built on internalizing how we see other people seeing us. And the master slave parable is really just that sort of idea. I think the other thing is mentioned at the top is that before Hegel, people like Hobbes and Locke thought about human nature in this sort of atomistic way. We are all essentially separate from each other. For Hegel, the master, the master and the slave, they interact. They have a sort of reciprocal relationship. And again, I think that that is um, philosophically a great step forward from the the, uh, the the enlightenment view of human nature. Absolutely. In fact, even in this parable, I can see the, the kind of next concept that you've picked out and how it links to Hegel's understanding of history, too. That's right. Yeah. So, again, I think um, Hegel was really the first person to start thinking about history in a philosophical way. And again, th th for me, this is one of his great appeals as a thinker. You know, today in our educational system, we have silos, we have the arts, the humanities, the science. Someone like Hegel really straddles all those sort of barriers. He's interested in looking at philosophy and history and lots of other things as well. So he's the first person really to try and think about history in a philosophical way. Uh, so uh, th that's, the, that's where that's what Engels identified. This was Hegel's great contribution to philosophy. You know, people like Hobbes and Locke and Descartes, yes, you should look at their ideas, but unless you put their ideas in historical context, it won't make any sense. So, so Hegel was interested in the mixed legacy of the French Revolution. So he, he did celebrate it. 
uh, I think there's another episode in 1815 when Napoleon returned from exile the last time before defeated at Waterloo. Hegel said that he would have volunteered if he could have done. So Hegel, Hegel still was a great supporter of the French Revolution right up to his you know, to the end of his life. But he understood that the French Revolution did have this mixed legacy. He wasn't blind to the, the excesses and the atrocities of the French Revolution. So he wanted to try and understand why the French Revolution offered hope, but then delivered the terror. So that's what he was interested in. And uh, for Hegel, if you look through history, history almost is an entity in itself. I mean, like Bertrand Russell had this great phrase for Hegel, uh, which is he saw history as jellied thought. In other words, hey, uh, history is almost an entity in itself, and it's sort of changing its shape over time. Now, for Hegel, uh, this German word Geist, now this is probably the most important idea in Hegel, and of course it gets translated in numerous ways. The absolute idea, or you can think about it as God, or you can think about, it, I think the existentialists, people like Sartre, they they, they saw the, the Geist as the unfolding of human consciousness. I think from a Marxist perspective, and someone like George Lukács particularly, that the Geist is really work, the working classes. So there's a lot of debates about what Geist means. If I think if you're totally new to Hegel, probably God is the simplest definition. So history is really God being aware of himself. Over the same. Again, people say, is Hegel a religious thinker? Yes, but not in an orthodox sense. It's not the sense that, okay, God presses a button and the world comes into existence. Uh, God's consciousness is is runs parallel to the unfolding of, of history. Mm. So all, all the different phases of human culture, the, the Greeks, the uh, Chinese culture, the Romans, the Reformation, etc. For Hegel, this is uh, the absolute idea or the geist achieving a level of self-consciousness and again the, the incredible ambition of Hegel which, which sounds like which appears like incredible arrogance is that he believed that it was in his thought that the geist had finally achieved self-consciousness um so that's that again that's sometimes why I think you know a lot of English-speaking philosophers think you know this guy is just a complete maniac but um I think you know to be more sympathetic it, it's an example of Hegel's ambition he believed that um, uh, his, his ideas represented finally history becoming aware of itself. Um, so I think it's quite yeah. interesting for for maybe like younger people watching this because you, you kind of approach a lot of these subjects that Hegel's talking about, whether it's history, philosophy, or sociology, is kind of atomized again and uh, concealed into separate departments. But really, what Hegel's getting at is this idea of bringing it all together essentially yeah um, I, I think i think the other thing that's useful as well in a contemporary context is that you know it's quite easy to watch the news and think oh my this is completely out of control it makes no sense whatever and again if you think about how uh, i think you know as uh as henry ford who said history is bunk and then you know, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, it was him as well i think who said history is one goddamn thing after another in other words it makes no sense it's just a random sequence of accidents I think the great thing about Hegel is that actually history does make sense, not necessarily in his way of thinking. But again, I think if you look at how Marx appropriates Hegel, history does make sense. It is about, from a Marxist perspective, it is a sequence of modes of production over the, over the millennia that gradually give human beings greater and greater control over their society and nature. And you know, again, we are now at a conjuncture in an Hegelian sense where we have the opportunity to actually take control of events rather than really what's happened so far, events have controlled us. So again, the, the optimism in Hegel is he does, history does make sense. You don't have to see everything as just a, a set of calamities. Absolutely, excellent. Quite well put that actually, um, in, in, ter in terms of understanding Hegel and, and I guess the, the historical direction that we're in at the moment. Yeah. So. Next concept we've got, which we mentioned in the last video as well, is the cunning of, of reason, which, again, you can very much hear an echo of, of Marx in this. Um, so I don't know if you want to expand on this, on the cunning of reason. Yeah, so I think we, we mentioned earlier about this, this, you know, this, this famous meeting between Napoleon and Hegel. In some ways, people think back to that at the same time. So Napoleon represented the embodiment of the Geist at the time. So Napoleon uh, created a, a unified French national state. He 
created the uh, French legal code, the French educational system, uh, French empire. So Napoleon, through his actions, uh, solidified the French national state and also spread enlightenment thinking throughout Europe and eventually around the world. So for Hegel, Napoleon had no understanding of his own historical importance, not in the Hegelian sense. History operates beneath the surface and people like Napoleon and Caesar and Alexander, they are being used by history. Remember, for Hegel, history is almost an entity. So this is what it means by the, the cunning of reason. So over the course of time, Hegel has this viewpoint that um, in Eastern societies, you know, what Matt Lucy called the Chinese empire, uh, for many centuries, the, the emperor was free and that's it. But also, let's say the Roman emperor was the only free person. The pharaoh was the only free person. So for the first few millennia of human history, there's only one person who was actually famous. And then uh, in the in the in uh, Greece in the fifth century BC, when democracy develops, then freedom freedom expands. So it doesn't include uh, foreigners, women, and slaves. But you still have a you still have for the first time a significant group of human beings being free. Uh, now when Marx, when when Hegel talks about Germanic societies, it's obviously not rather clunky phrase, but he's really talking about the Reformation societies, so the, the Lutheran Reformation. And of course, Luther pioneered the idea of in, that religion is fundamentally your relationship to God. So Luther takes the church out of the equation. So the focus is on the individual will and individual freedom. And again, for Hegel, that again, is the Geist expanding. And the French Revolution is really the, the culmination of the process. So for the first time, you really have mass democracy, thanks to the French Revolution. But again, Hegel was interested in how did the French Revolution go wrong in, in the sense of the terror? And the, the terror for Hegel was really, in a sense, that the, the, the geist running out of control. It, it, it was an, an excess of reason. People like Robespierre uh, it imposed reason in an abstract way. So Hegel saw himself as trying to uh, correct the, the excesses of, of Robespierre. And then the, the final point, again, is a remarkable bit of precedence from Hegel, who was writing right in the 1820s, 1830s. And he, he predicted that the US would become the most advanced society in the world, politically, technologically, philosophically even. And that would be as the consequence of a war between the North and the South of the US. And of course, that happens in the 1860s. So the, the US today, of course, does really represent the culmination, and the climax of capitalism. And uh, I think it's quite remarkable that, that Hegel really foresaw that uh, writing in the 1820s. So he, the, Hegel saw the US as the culmination of, of the historical spirit. I think this idea of, of history progressing through conflict and contradiction is um again an interesting notion relating to what you were talking about in the idea of history before um the history was previously seen as something that was just random one thing repeating after another and instead we actually have a somewhat almost well almost scientific explanation as to why um key events kind of change history or why key events happen yeah i think uh, for, for hegel that there is a thread running through history so for him, the thread is the unfolding of the geist. So that's not necessarily one that we, you know, we would all accept today. But this idea that um, that there has been progress. You know, Hegel really defends the concept of progress. Um, and again, if you look at the world today, it's easy to say, well, OK, actually, things are actually going backwards. Maybe even things are getting worse. But um, if you have a Hegelian perspective, you can hang on to that, that progress and that optimism. Yeah. And, and that's something that I think we've actually neglected to mention about about uh, Hegel, which I think you I'm glad you raised this idea that for Hegel, you know, history is progressive. Like as we keep moving forward, things are always going to get better. Um, and I think that's something really important that we should probably point out about Hegel and the idea of history and the cun and cunning of reason um, really build into that idea of progressiveness and that things are getting better, even if they don't seem to. Yeah, that's right. And uh, of course, in his own personal experience, I suppose we should say, is that at the end of his life, Hegel really did make compromises with the Prussian state. And he did say that, in a sense, history had really climaxed with the Prussian state. And again, I think one of the differences, again, where Marx comes in and the rest and the left Hegelians is that 
history cannot stop with the Prussian state. The Prussian state has its own inequalities and injustices and contradictions. History has to, surely there has to be something better than the Prussian state. I think something else you should also say is that, you know, we, we shouldn't be blind to Hegel's weaknesses. And there's a lot of Eurocentrism here. It's a very Eurocentric view of the world. Uh, you know, Europe represents the climax, um, really uh, at developing on Oriental barbarism, essentially. So, you know, we shouldn't be blind to the, 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 you know, the defects of uh, Hegel's approach to things. Absolutely. I think well pointed out. So the next one, I think, I think we keep talking about the state and kind of how Hegel would envision um, the kind of historical state or the kind of end of not not quite end of history, but where what which direction we're traveling. So do you want to expand expand just on the Hegelian state? Yeah, so the, the top line is one of the most famous things that Hegel ever said. And sometimes so what it's is real is rational and what is rational is real. Yes. So sometimes this is interpreted as, as Hegel justifying the status quo. It was the, the Prussian monarchy in the sort of 1830s. The, the Prussian monarchy, because it's there, it must be rational. And uh, because it's rational, it must be there. So it's, it's a very sort of, it looks like a tautology. It can look rather sort of mundane. And I say sometimes it's been interpreted as a Hegel as the as the ultra conservative. Whatever whatever exists must exist for reason. Um, and Hegel was undoubtedly a, a supporter of the Prussian monarchy towards the end of his life. But I think it, it, I think the, the key to this, maybe if, if we look at um, this idea of uh, three moments of political existence, of course, Hegel's, Hegel's understanding of politics is far wider than the sort of the conventional one. Hegel, for Hegel, politics is really the sort of mixture of politics and sociology as we would understand it. So if you think about when we come into the world, our first sort of political existences within the family uh, uh, but the families inevitably over the course of time break up and they and they they create new relationships and the original family let's say your stereotypical nuclear family over the course of time that actually physically disappears so that for Hegel that that can't be the basis of, of politics civil society is what you might loosely call uh, the economy or, or uh, um, competition and again, Hegel understood that, that civil society, the market economy, will actually lead to inequalities between rich and poor. So the, so neither the family nor civil society can be the basis of a political settlement. So for Hegel, this is where the state comes in. Again, I think if you make this parallel with Keynes, it's quite a useful one. For, he, for Hegel, the state has this sort of Keynesian role, is to regulate the economy, to prevent inequalities between rich and poor, and, and fundamentally to provide a source of identity for people. And uh, I think, you know, the, the image is, again, it's from classical Athens. And again, Hegel saw Athens in the sort of Periclean era as a sort of model to go for, because the men who were free, the state was part of their existence, that it was part of their identity. Um, so for Hegel, the, the, he saw the Prussian monarchy as a sort of version of the of the Athenian state, something that Germans in the 1820s should really give their loyalty to. It will provide them with a sort of identity. Now, this is the root. A lot of people regard Hegel as a totalitarian thinker. The state is all powerful. And uh, I think, you know, he is vulnerable to that criticism. And a lot of his harshest critics, people like Karl Popper, this is why they were quite dismissive of Hegel, because they saw Hegel sometimes being seen as a proto-fascist which I think is ridiculous. But th this is where that criticism comes from, that Hegel does want this very powerful state. Yeah, I think that's quite interesting to talk about Hegel's reputation, because quite a few of the people we talk about uh, in previous videos have also had similar accusations. But it's just coming back to the idea that philosophy is a toolbox, and obviously he's still vulnerable to the interpretation of, of language as well. Um, yeah. But this idea of a strong state, I think, is... Well, I quite like the through line that Hegel's got in terms of our relationship with the state. As we move from family into civil society, we then have this uh, kind of increasing role in, in our lives and mm. the connection with modern liberalism there. I yeah, think I think quite uh, interesting. Yeah, again, I think, you know, we, we've, we've, we've come to see the state as something that is separate from us, something that is over us, whereas Hegel's conception is that collectively we are the state. 
mm. which is very much the sort of the classical Greek approach. So it can be distorted into a sort of proto-fascist approach. But again, in terms of Hegel and fascism, I should also say that he was a, he was a, a very vocal critic of anti-Semitism, um, and also in a sort of progressive way. He's actually one of the one of the first German scholars to argue that that uh, women should be allowed into higher education. Mm. So. Um, so that links to his idea of the state as well. That if we are all the state, then then they should that that should happen essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the the the, the state is really there to um, expand our own sense of identity. Again, if you think about the master slave parable. It's very much this idea that our identity really come collaborating and working together with others. Whereas, of course, you know the the. Uh, very much the, the Anglo-Saxon approach to human nature is that our identity is, is atomistic, insular, inward looking. Um, in Isaiah Berlin famously sort of divided concepts of freedom into the positive and the negative approach of freedom. Hegel is very much a positive freedom thinker. Uh, our subjectivity is really developed from intersubjectivity. My notion of myself comes from interacting with other people, which is very much part of the positive approach. So. The, the state is not something over us. We are the state, essentially. Brilliant, brilliant notions. Um, so the next one, this is the big one. This is probably what most people watching from around the world came here for. Uh, I'm going to let you provide a condensed uh, kind of understanding of Hegelian dialectics. And I agree with the, the quote we've got from Lenin here, which is that these parts of the work should be called a best means of getting a headache because uh, they are quite, quite complex. Um, so I don't know if you want to expand, if you want to expand on, or well, I'll try to simplify what Hegelian dialectics is. Yes, yeah, so we've left this to the last because I think if, if people have coped with what we've got to so far, this is like, you, you, you got through the court final and the semi final. Now this is the this is the final. I so can you, almost you, I can, it's that point in a Zizek lecture where he just starts going off on one and no one knows what he's saying, but he's entertaining enough. There there is a risk of that definitely. So I suppose let's try and let's try and uh, get through it. So for for Hegel, if if we think about existence at its most basic level, if we think about um, our existence, think about any object, a glass, a table, a chair, a human being. The fundamental thing is that person has being, that person exists. That That is the rawest part of our experience of the world. But of course, the moment you think about yourself as separate from other people, or the or the better way to think about it, you think about yourself as, let's say, 100 years from now, you will not exist. You will be nothing. Uh, and likewise, you know, let's say uh, any, any physical object, over the course of my it might take centuries or even millennia every physical object will not exist it will be nothing so if you look at those two polarities there's got to be something in the middle and that is where this concept of becoming is so there will always be a point for example each of us as a physical entity we are becoming older and there will come a point where our, our aging gets the stage where our entire physical existence is terminated. So for Hegel, this is the fundamental, what you might call the laws of the motion of the universe. It affects every object, every person and every idea. So is, is this idea of, uh, of movement, which is the key to Hegelian dialectics. And again, I think th this is fundamentally a philosophy of movement, motion, dynamism. Whereas, again, a lot of pre hegelian thinking was very static. And this is why I think, you know, Hegel is such a valuable thinker, because whatever problem you're in or whatever situation you are in, fast forward a certain period of time and it sort of, it changes. So for me, this, this is the crux of this particular aspect of the Hegelian philosophy, how we need to understand how motion and pro, remember process is always important for Hegel, process in the master-slave relationship, process in history, process in the evolution of the state. For th this is Hegel really um, pulling out how motion operates at, at every fundamental level of, of nature, essentially. Yeah, I think I quite like that notion of motion. Um, so, just to so just to kind of clarify for people watching, we've kind of got two poles, haven't we? We've got being, which is kind of you being born and Stein, and then you've got um, the, no the synthesis or the notion or idea, which is essentially death the end of your life but 
Hegel's focusing on this idea of becoming and this notion of movement. That's what is essentially the process for him, isn't it? That's right. And it's really, it's really the, the, the becoming part is the most interesting part. You know, in yeah. some ways, it's, it's very Deleuzian in a way, to, even though Deleuze claimed to be anti-Hegelian, his entire philosophy is based on this concept of becoming. So, again, another person who owes more to Hegel. Shall I move on to the next slide? Yeah, OK. OK. Here we go. So we've got this quote from from Hegel here. So we've got we find the consciousness of dialectic in those universally familiar proverbs. Pride comes before a fall. Too much wit outwits itself. It is well known how the extremes of pain and joy pass into one another. The heart filled with joy relieves itself in tears and the deepest melancholy tends to, in certain circumstances to make itself known by a smile. So do you want to expand on, on this quote a little bit? Yeah, I so at the end of the the end of part one, I mentioned that actually I think people, most people do think in a negating way without realizing it. And I think this is this is exactly what I'm talking about. Is that think about our own personal experiences. There are sometimes when you can't decide whether you're actually excited about something or or frightened about something. And uh, in this particular case, the, the, now this by the way is is from Hegel directly. So. This is Hegel can some very abstract, but there are times when he actually comes up with these real flashes of insight that make his ideas very relevant and very understandable. And I think this one about how our emotions often uh, feed into it, some apparently quite contradictory emotions can actually blend into each other. I think he's one of the, the, the best ways of seeing the actual relevance of Hegel to our, our own personal experience. I think the other thing is, again, to link it, what, to link it to Hegelian dialectics, remember they talked about the being and the becoming and the nothing. So if you think about how in you know one, how sometimes um, uh, pain and joy seem at opposite ends of experience, but there is a point when they actually one becomes the other. So I think this is a good illustration of he Hegelian dialectics from Hegel himself. Yeah, so it's, it's that kind of um, not to use the term overcoming, but I couldn't think of a better word. But it's those kind of opposite notions which are central to the dialectic those opposite notions creating something new which again links to that notion of movement too yeah and again this concept of sublation so sublation is this idea how how um apparently again in this in this example how pain and joy look like separate experiences but actually if you meld them together the 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 upshot or the 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 the, the, the sublation of the two is something that really combines both Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's a really, really good quote, actually, articulating mm -hmm. dialect, dialectic to every day. So let's have a look at the dialectic structure of reason then. So we've got a grasp of the dialectic. It's this notions of, of opposites and we're focusing on the becoming aspect. So how do we uh, link it over to the dialectic structure of reason? This, so th this is Hegel at his most fundamental level. So on the uh, on the previous slide of the diagram, See, we had we had being contrasted with nothing. That's that's right. So, so the, the self estrangement. I think the, the contradiction is the key for Hegel. So within every idea there is contradiction. I get another straightforward example. Every person who comes into the world, of course, genetically we are programmed to die. So with it, you know, if you think of every new human life, there is death within it. Over uh, in many decades ahead in the future. So in in this sense the for Hegel, every idea, every entity has has the contradictions within it, or imminent, as it's sometimes translated. So the, the the motion of the universe, or the motion of every entity, is based on these contradictions that are, in a sense, programmed into every idea, every entity, every object. So the, the, this is the this is the, the 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 mobility and the dynamism of the system. And this concept of self estrangement is this idea that uh, self-estrangement is sometimes translated as alienation. Mm. Uh, alienation is the way in which the, the different components of an idea can be pulled apart to, to create something different. Uh, I, I won't talk a lot about Kant, Ficht and, Shea and, and Schelling, mm. uh, apart from the fact that uh, Ficht and Schelling were interested in, okay, what's most important in, in the universe? Is it the subject or the object? So they, they disagreed on which was which was the most important. And again, Hegel tried to put together the subject and the object. Um, 
So the, the, the geist is the subject of history, and when it achieves realization, it becomes the object at the same time. Um, so the, this, the, 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 the quote there towards the bottom is that the contradiction really is the key. And again, I think, you know, contradiction really explains so much of, of history, of our experience. I mean, again, I think it makes me think about the classic Life of Rhyme sketch where the, the rebels are debating what have the Romans ever done for us? And of course, they go through um, aqueducts, roads, running water, etc. At the same time that they are being brutally oppressed. Yeah. Again, this is what Hegel's talking about. You, you cannot look at any political system, any political culture, without seeing the contradictions within it. Uh, and again, it's supposed to be relevant. Brexit. Uh, I think everyone's forgotten what that is by now. <laughs> seems like ancient history now, but of course, a lot of people dismiss the you know, Brexit voters must be racist, um, anti-immigration, right-wing, etc. But of course, within the Brexit vote, there was what we might call a left-wing version of the Brexit vote. So I, th I think this subtlety, when we look at political problems, is essentially a and, and the essence of the Hegelian approach. Yeah, it's the idea that things aren't necessarily black and white as well, isn't it? That actually the picture is yeah. more, more complicated. Exactly. Absolutely. So let's just, oh, we've got another quote here. So we've got, the bud disappears when the blossom breaks through. And we might say that the former is refuted by the latter. In the same way, when the fruit comes, the blossom may be explained to be a false form of the plant's existence. For the fruit appears as its true nature in place of the blossom. The ceaseless activity of their own inherent nature makes these stages uh, moments of an organic unity, where they not merely, uh, sorry, where they not merely do not contradict one another, but where one is as necessary as the other and constitutes thereby the life of the whole. So, do you want to just expand on that quote very, very briefly? It's a very nice quote. It is, yeah, and again, it's a good example of how Hegel can quite often be very poetic and very straightforward to understand. And I think it's also a good illustration of um, the importance of process for Hegel, the importance of avoiding static thinking, the importance of seeing how there are contradictions that actually push things forward, and uh, also this sort of triadic structure. So you've got the bud, you've got the, the blossom, and you've got the tree. So again, I think it's a very easy to understand, you know, when you look at things like being, becoming, nothing, it can look abstract. But this, I think this is a brilliant illustration of what Hegel is talking about and something that, again, people can relate to in a very straightforward sort of way. And the practicality of his philosophy as well, which I think is really, really key and, and kind of contradicts those reputations that he has. Mm. So I think we'll just do some kind of concluding thoughts, um, just kind of on what you think Hegel's uh, legacy is. So the, the quote at the bottom is something that Hegel wrote as a young man. Uh, and he was really, he's not writing by himself, but I think it does apply to himself, actually, because I think Hegel's thinking embodies the great progress of things like the revolution, the industrial revolution, but also the contradictions within those things. So from a Marxist perspective, Hegel is the highest peak of bourgeois philosophy. Because it's at that point when the bourgeoisie across Europe was really blasting apart the, uh, the, the shell of feudal society, particularly in France. So Hegel really represents the, the peak of bourgeois philosophy. And I think, you know, you mentioned people like Deleuze and, and Nietzsche afterwards. And uh, although all those people react to Hegel, but um, Hegel really, re really, really represents the summit of bourgeois philosophy. So not... No one's saying that philosophy since Hegel is pointless, but a lot of it is really a reaction to Hegel. And I think to, we talked about at the beginning, why is it worth, why is Hegel have this rather forbidding reputation? Because for us in the English speaking world, I think we are, Hegel is regarded as dangerous because uh, of course the English and the Americans had their revolution before the French and they thought, okay, that's settled. Hegel represents when the bourgeois revolution was still surging through in France and Germany, particularly when bourgeois thinking was still dynamic and dangerous. So Hegel's negative reputation in the English speaking world, I think, is partly a reflection of the fact that the, the British and the American bourgeoisie didn't need the dynamism of Hegel because they'd already achieved what they needed to do. So 
and that's also why you know we suffer because we are not encouraged to think dialectically. I mean, you know, we we know with our students sometimes they say to us, "Okay, w what's the right answer?" As if there is only one answer. Hegel encourages us to think actually there's multiple possible answers, and not necessarily one of them is the right answer. I'm actually so, hoping that one of the things people get from this series that that I've been doing online is the fact that not having answers is okay. And actually, I kind of agree with the point that perhaps not having answers highlights the intellectual maturity of a society too. Yeah, and, I, and again, I think there's a truism in education that actually the question is more important than the answer. Mm. And that is very much an Hegelian approach. Absolutely. So the last thing that we just want to talk about is the theory of everything or this notion that Hegel has a theory of everything. And we've got this quote from Engels here. Uh, for the first time, the whole world, natural, historical, intellectual, is represented as a process, i.e. as in constant motion, change, transformation, development. And the attempt is made to trace out the internal connection that make uh, a continuous whole of all movement and development. And I really like this, this idea or this concept. And of course, in theoretical physics, there's this notion of the unified field, which if they, they can prove it, it kind of gives more validity to Hegel's philosophy, really. Um, but I just wonder if you had anything to say about this idea of connecting or Hegel almost having a theory of everything. Again, this is this is the ambition of Hegel that I think really puts him in a league of his own. This, this attempt to try and look at all levels of, of human experience, really. Literature, culture, politics, history, philosophy, and see how they're, they're they are connected in a way. Now, of course, Hegel saw them as connected to the absolute idea, achieving self-realization. We don't necessarily need to use that concept, but I think this idea that um, that uh, all the all these different areas of human endeavor do have a shared experience, I think, is something that we should actually take on board. And again, I think to be relevant, I think the thing about the coronavirus crisis is it affects every single person on the planet. It really is a total crisis. And I think an Hegelian perspective is to see how the, the coronavirus is affecting. There's a political aspect to it. There's an economic aspect. There's a cultural aspect that re you, you can't really understand the, the coronavirus crisis unless you take in all these different perspectives. So I think in, in, you know, there is a sense in which the, this idea of totality is really what we need right now. And really, Hegel is really the only thinker who gives us that. Excellent. Well, I think those are some pretty nice concluding remarks, actually. So thank you very much for your time again, Sean. And thank you again for your expertise and for explaining to people kind of the key concepts relating to Hegel put so eloquently as always. Thank you, Rhys. It's been a pleasure. And like I say, if you want to hear more from, from myself or Sean, you can, of course, uh, find some more videos on YouTube um, on, on my site. I've also got a WordPress account and I would suggest that you read the stuff on Counterfire, which Sean regularly uh, contributes to. I've contributed some stuff as well, but they also put, have a daily output, which is worth keeping up with. And we shall leave it there. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you later. Thanks again, Sean. Thanks, Reese.